Okay, so the recording has started. We'll pray and uh, get started. Kiran, can you lead us? Yes, ma'am, sir. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, we come before your throne once again and we want to say thanking you, Father God, for all you you turn for us, Father God, thanking you. Father God, give your wisdom and knowledge, Father God, to the subject that we can understand nicely and we can apply to your kingdom work. Help us to uh, lead forward, Father God, to upcoming time. All the students are meeting to your hand, Father God. Uh, they are willing to join, help them to join the classes, Father God. Thank you. The rest of the time submitting to your hand. Take care of every side. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kiran. So in the last class, we uh, uh, started with First Peter. And we have looked at uh, um, chapter 1, moved into uh, chapter 2 as well. So that's what we are going to study today. We'll continue from where we stopped. So we'll go back to chapter 2. Uh, and I was explaining the background to all of us and saying that uh, you know, Peter is addressing the church of um, the Gentiles uh, during a very challenging time when there was uh, persecution and uh, according to history the persecution only got worse um, you know the the leadership was to be passed on to nero later and under him many atrocities happened uh, against those who believed in jesus christ so um, these were difficult times these were um, you know, times where people could have easily given up on their faith. And that is why Peter brings this exhortation as well as instruction. I told us that he talks about um, how to live out this Christian life in uh, cer cer certain settings. So we, we will have a look at it. So chapter one, as we saw, he pours out encouragement and helps them recognize, helps the people recognize that they are uh, <clears throat> citizens of heaven. However, they live here on the earth and uh, that their reward is eternal, that God has done a lasting work through uh, the cross for them. So basically, he is helping them know that the hope which they have is a great hope. And because of that, you know, they should live a life on here on the earth, which honors God. Uh, and, um, you know, which is also, which is also um, a very righteous life. So we'll see, you know, he will touch on um, how to, how to be with, uh, uh, how to serve as an employee, how to, um, a little bit about the role of husband and wife, you know, things like that. So he will touch on all the practical aspects as well, so that people really know how to, um, live this honorable life which Peter is calling them to live. So in chapter 2 beginning we saw that he encouraged the people to live a holy life. He said put away um, you know uh, works of the flesh, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy. So these things are not uh, good for those who are professing that they now believe in God. So, you know, the life has to match up to the uh, confession which we have. Okay, so that's what he's uh, inviting the believers to do. And we also observe that he calls the um, believers to love God's word. You know, he says that instead of doing evil things, uh, earnestly desire. Earnestly desire there would be, uh, or actually he just says desire. It's not earnestly desire, desire. But the kind of meaning that this word desire carries is when uh, in Psalm 42, the psalmist writes as the deer pants. So, you know, a yearning and a longing of the spirit for something which will satisfy it. So, he says, our uh, desire for God's word should be so strong, you know, like uh, newborn babies that desire milk. No newborn baby will will uh, reject milk. In fact, they, they love to be fed. 
uh, you know as often as possible and a normal a healthy baby will will want will cry for it so in the same way even our desire for god's word should be so strong is what he is he's telling the believers and then he goes on to talking about the lord jesus that um, uh, you know he has become our cornerstone uh, he also Mm, uh, points out that you no know, Jesus was was uh, rejected by people, but he is chosen by God, and uh, God has uh, uh, made him the center, you know, of of our faith. And then he points out to the believers, and he says that you are all living stones. So how does God build the build the temple? Uh, obviously, the stones which he uses are people. Okay, so we are the living stones and we offer up uh, spiritual sacrifices so we do our part and then god is using each one of us to build his um, build his eternal kingdom so that's the way god works so you see that there's a lot of encouragement a lot of encouragement a lot of exhortation and he is uh, he is uh, gently nudging them to to live a godly life because uh, so much has been done by jesus for them then you know he goes on to also uh, letting these people know that they are not lower spiritually uh, to the jews because the same kind of um uh, you know the 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 kind of um attention and uh, love and blessings that God wants for the Jews. Now that people are in Christ Jesus, he is giving it to every community. And I pointed out that these people were Gentiles. Okay. So um, at the, in those, in this context, uh, during that times, there was a very big distinction that, oh, okay, you know, the Jews are blessed, the Jews are called, they are chosen, but other communities are not. So Peter is uh, telling these people that, come on, you know, now that you are in Jesus Christ, you are also chosen. So we saw that beautiful passage where they are told that you are chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, his own special people. And why? Why did God do all this for us? So that we can proclaim the praises of this God who has uh, saved us so marvelously and brought us into his light. Okay, So uh, recognize the mercy of God. We Even today, you know, for us, uh, we can recognize what the Lord Jesus has done in buying us back through uh, his work on the cross so let's continue from verse 11 um, we will you know in a, in a little more depth we will go and then we will keep going to the uh, following chapters here okay so yeah verse 11 of uh, first peter chapter 2 okay all right so once again here he points out that uh, we are sojourners and pilgrims so that's like a temporary status it's like you know you are in the world but you're not of the world so don't get too attached to the world so that's the point he says um abstain from flesh fleshly lusts which war against the soul so he's also pointing out that you know for uh for people for us uh, we have many challenges that satan brings our way um, mainly in the mind you know he attacks us and uh, we might think that giving in to um, some of these weaknesses will not affect us you know um, it's like saying that a little bit you know a little bit
Okay, hi everybody. I hope uh, you can hear me now. Yes, ma'am. Now there was a power cut, so yes, I just got disconnected. It's okay, okay. ma'am. Sure, sure, sure. So it's uh, going a little on and off. So uh, please bear with me. Uh, is it fast enough? You're able to be in time, or is there a lag? Audible, ma'am. Audible. Okay, then I'll carry on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I really hope, uh, you know, this gets better because the the power is going off and coming back on. So let's see. Um, anyway, so what I've been saying is that when we look at scripture, though we are, we are looking at this in context and, um, you know, we are, uh, we are gaining the main instructions that Peter has in um, these um, letters uh, as you read the details there is so much more that we can understand so one thing that we are we are able to figure out here is that fleshly lusts have a property to destroy the soul so you know uh, let's just say you know yeah maybe young people who are um, uh, influenced by ungodly friends uh, their friends might say things like hey nothing will happen or nobody will come to know it's okay you know we can indulge in certain things um and uh, uh, just for the sake of you know pleasure and everyone else is doing it uh, and with the assumption that okay i'll get into it and i'll get out of it nobody will know and it's just like you know time pass but you see very clearly what Peter is saying here. He's saying that fleshly lusts, when we entertain any form of fleshly lust, what will it do? It will war against the soul. So in other words, you could say that it will cause destruction of the soul part of us. So that will be our mind, will, and our emotions. And sometimes, you know, even for believers, they you know, engage in all these worldly things and uh, then wonder, you know, why am I not feeling healthy in my soul? Why am I not able to make decisions? Or why am I not uh, experiencing consistent, uh, you know, steady emotions? Uh, it could also be that uh, one is uh, not these fleshly lusts. So if at all, you know, someone has opened up doors for fleshly lusts, then it's very important for them to shut it. So instead of these things, what did he say earlier? He said, desire the word. So that should be our focus. And he also points out that it is important for us to have a good testimony. Sometimes as believers, we say, okay, my relationship is only with God. Now, don't ask me um, to think about people around me. No, it's okay. Whatever people think, it's fine. Now, this is not about pleasing people because we know in other passages of the Bible, we are encouraged to look for the approval of God. So we are people who want that 
but at the same time uh, to maintain a testimony is also very important you know uh, because you tell me otherwise if we don't maintain a good testimony or here he says let your conduct be honorable let it be honorable especially especially he says among the gentiles or the other unbelievers around you now let's say uh, some believer is not uh, walking honorably living a sinful life uh, giving into all kinds of lusts now if this person goes and preaches to uh, some unbeliever do you think that they will um, respond ke like likelihood is no because people will look at the life of this person and think oh look at you you yourself are um, not uh, transformed in any way uh, and, and why do you want me to you know accept this gospel so that would be the reaction of the people and that is the uh, important reason why um, our conduct or our testimony is also important and by this we are not saying that or project one personality to people outside and be another person no but integrity integrity is you are the same person okay your attitude your heart your character is the same you are not trying to change it uh, for different people so if we have that kind of a character uh, it it is honorable okay before the people then uh, the people even if they have accusations against us they would look at our conduct and they would know that uh, yeah there is nothing we can point out and blame this person for so you know in this manner he um, encourages the believer first of all know that your uh, outlook towards this life should be eternal and you know you're so blessed god has made you a uh, a uh, chosen people because of his mercy think about all these things so let go of an evil way of living life instead live a righteous life to the extent that others also should look at you and say okay these are god's people so that is the uh, the encouragement that he brings to the people now going into a little more details of how to actually live out this this honorable life here you would uh, see that he is asking the believers to submit to authority so he says therefore in verse 13 submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the lord's sake okay so very important whenever we talk about submission we will again talk about you know submission um in the next chapter submission is for the lord's sake okay so when we think that i am being obedient for what to honor god then obedience comes easy then you know being subject to an authority comes easy because it is yes it is uh, for the sake of the authority but it is also for the sake of god so that is the christian way of submitting or the believers we have submitting our submission is first to god and that is why we have submission to you know someone that god has placed in authority over us and look here he says that every ordinance of man whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him so we have to look at people who are positioned in authority as those who have been in other words appointed by god sent by god appointed or you know like god has permitted them to be in those positions because there is a good work that he wants them to do so what is god's uh, plan for people in authority uh, he says the punishment of evil doers for the praise of those who do good so they are um, there to regulate right and wrong so we must not look at people in authority and think what is this you know why has god even placed them and also if you remember i told us that uh, the time at which peter is writing all these things is a very tough time um, and uh, you know persecution was was 
happening right before their eyes and i don't have to you know recall the kind of persecution that used to take place in those days you know beating up people imprisoning them taking away their property so many things were happening physically harming um, those who profess faith in jesus so in the midst of all this for peter to say that authority has been sent by god it's a very big thing it's a very big thing um so if they were looking at their authorities as sent by god you know how much more we can look at our governing authorities as sent by god uh yeah and we see that they are called to uphold the right things um yeah and then we are also told that we must honor all people and love the brotherhood for fear of god and honor the king so everyone in the community you know everyone around um we have to live such a godly life that uh, we are honoring them but notice you know, he is also adding here love the brotherhood so it has to really be uh, <clears throat> from the depths of one's being to love those who are in christ jesus so honor love those are the the points that he is making now moving on to verse 18 here he says servants be submissive to your masters with all fear so servants is who servants in those days were um, more like slaves okay in the authority structure which they had uh, there would be masters and there would be servants or more like uh, uh, people who are sold off to you know a particular person and their entire life is is over there so uh, even in that situation you know he brings back this term be submissive what is submissive to be subject to and if you look at you know the translation of that word you um see that it also talks about obedient because obviously in the case of authority there are generally instructions isn't it which are given to the subordinates so whatever that is you be obedient to it and that's what he's saying be obedient and obedience with honor we okay, will we'll, uh, uh, see that so be obedient to your masters with all fear what fear is this he already said when he talked about governing authorities he said for whose sake should you submit to them for god's sake for god's sake so in the same way when we are submitting to our um, authorities at work now in our context we don't really have the slave master kind of a setup it's more like you know uh, we go work with someone and then you know we we are back so they would be so master is not really applicable for us but you know our uh, seniors our uh, senior colleagues our management those are those are the authority structures in today's um, you know to today's uh, scenario and that's what we are talking about we can be subject to them and be uh, walking in as per their instructions uh, and you see he says not only to the good and gentle but also to the harsh so again living from uh, during their times for peter to say this is something really great because people were very harsh can you imagine uh, slavery and um, you know owning people and uh, so there were uh, essentially zero to no rights uh, you know some to no rights for the um, uh, workers uh, but even in those circumstances you know he is telling them to be submissive because this is only through the faith which they had in god so when we have faith in god we can uh, trust that i am doing the right thing even if the person in authority over me may not be doing the right thing i know that god will reward me for my faithfulness so that is the faith which he is um exhorting the believers to have 
Okay, so just little bit, I'm going to back up over here when we talked about submitting to authorities. Now I have a question for all of you. Should we submit to everything? Because for God's sake, we have to submit, isn't it? But what if the authorities tell us to do something against, uh, you know, God? What to do then? Any idea? No, we cannot uh, do. If, if anything is against, we can submit. But if it comes to the matter of God and faith, we cannot... <laughs> mm. Still, we respect and honor, but we are not ready to do what he has to do anything against mm. God, against the word of God. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Are there any examples from scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, where you see people following what you just said? We can say, see in the Old Testament, Daniel and friends, they were in the king's court only. They were okay. honoring the king and everything, but when it comes to the matter is idols, they were very strong. We, we, we don't want to worship. We will not worship. That's that's where they stand. They read mm. through any kind of thing. They went to fire. But they used to honor king, but they don't want to worship. Because they want to worship only Jehovah. You can see like True. that. Yes, yes. Yeah, so that's true, um, Thomas. Thank you for that. And here in the chat, uh, Dev has posted New Testament with the disciples. So you remember uh, even when um, Peter and John, you know, they go and they um, uh, uh, heal that that man, the lame man, okay, the gate beautiful. Then so many things, they are rebuked. Uh, they are instructed, okay, don't worship, don't uh, preach in the name of uh, this Jesus, so many things. So at that point, you know, they say, you tell us, who should we follow, you or God? So when it, we have to be submissive to the governing authorities, but when it comes to an incident where they are asking us to go against God, then, you know, we can be... Uh, very very clear that hey we can't do that okay so uh, this is how you would interpret it and apply it so you have to look at the um, other passages of scripture also okay here it says right be subject to every ordinance of god for the lord's sake and that's how it is now for me to examine this i have to see okay where else does this uh, submitting to authorities happen how did they do it in a time when they were asked to go against god okay so when you look at it in that manner then we can understand that uh, no we have to stand up for god in moments like that now once again you know coming back to verse 18 here we see that uh, it says servants be submissive uh, we've seen that and uh, not just to the gentle but also to the harsh so in case we are working in some setup and uh, you know people are not uh, that that uh, gentle with us uh, we should still maintain honor for them we should still um, you know uh, follow the guidance instructions that they give to us be obedient you know, as as employees to our bosses uh, then again he says if because of conscience toward god one endures grief see again as he said earlier for the lord's sake what is this conscience toward god so how can one be submissive in such a situation when we are thinking about god and pleasing god Okay, so our submission to our authority is actually because of our submission to God. That's how it works. So he says, suppose we end your grief or uh, there is a painful situation or you're suffering wrongfully, you're doing the right things, you're carrying the right attitude at work, but still, you know, maybe one is being bullied at work or one is being ill-treated, one is being... Uh, 
you know uh, unjustly um, kept at a uh, lower position so many things happen isn't it at the workplace but he says no matter what is happening you have a right attitude okay for the sake of god because of your conscience toward god if wrongfully you are suffering or you're enduring grief you know don't worry uh, and also he's reminding them if at all we go through um such wrong uh, or, or injustice uh, please know that god is faithful god is watching everything okay but if let's say we are suffering even though we are doing good then he reminds the believers and he says that it is a good thing it is commendable before god see what is the use if we do something that is wrong and we are suffering for that there's no use isn't it but if you are doing the right thing and you know you're suffering for that then don't worry don't worry because god is watching over us so that is what we are being told here okay let's move on to verse 21 so explaining this further about carrying the right attitude um, in submission he points us to the lord jesus and how jesus suffered now all of you will agree that it was very unjust jesus was such a sinless he was a sinless person and yet he had to endure um emotional physical uh afflictions of many kinds w- was it fair we can all say no no it was not fair but he was submitted to god and that is why he was willing to endure the pain of the cross and in the same way injustice in our you know uh, life situations Uh, especially in the uh, workplace so he's saying that if at all it happens uh, you consider the lord jesus you know he was sinless and yet he suffered okay and also with what attitude did he suffer you no know, it's really beautiful sometimes we suffer but in our suffering you no know, we grumble we blame we com- uh, we um, accuse we say oh you're doing this to me you wait and see you know what god is going to do or uh, uh i am right i'm so right and we just want everyone to know i'm so right you see god is going to judge this person so we make a a big deal out of our submission the attitude we may be doing the right thing but the attitude which we carry may not be right and the spirit may not be right but you notice here it says about jesus uh, i am um, in the passage from 21 verse 21 to 25 it says he suffered jesus suffered how did he suffer see that attitude which he carried he was refi- he was reviled did not revile in return he did not threaten but he committed himself to him who judges righteously you see again for god's sake he went through what he went through and um, what did jesus do so this is a beautiful scripture 1 peter 2 verse 24 it says himself bore our sins remember he has become our sin bearer we've studied this in hebrews we saw that uh, earlier what the uh, temple worship was able to do for the people was just to cover their sin but not take away their sin but jesus became our sin bearer and he bore our sins in his own body to do what to take it away from us okay then we are told having died to sins we might live for righteousness so in what jesus has done there is another truth which for us as believers we must understand now i too can identify with the death of jesus so what how do we identify jesus died on the cross but i as a believer i have died to my sins and i now live for righteousness so that truth has to become very very real to us that the power of sin is broken okay romans 6 talks about it the power of sin is broken so 
can a believer live a righteous life yes first peter 224 it says that the lord jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree which is the cross so that what that we having died to sin should live for righteousness might live for righteousness so it is possible for every believer to die to sin and to live for righteousness so whenever temptation comes to us or you know whenever we are in a uh uh you know a very very uh, difficult situation where maybe doing the wrong thing is the way out we can tell ourselves no you know jesus he bore my sins in his body on a tree and um, you know uh, so that i having died to sins might live for righteousness so i can live for righteousness i should die to the sin and i should live for righteousness so we can remind ourselves of the truth of god's word and that's why every believer is called to victory because jesus has already made it possible for us to be victorious even against um you know any any uh, temptation oppression deception of the enemy and you know we are also told that by the stripes of jesus we were healed so jesus has done a mighty work on the cross for us and now you know, he continues to tell the believers that uh, you were like sheep going astray but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul or uh, you have come back to jesus christ who is the one who will guide you and lead you so in um, chapter 2 if you simply want to look at the sections you know what are the things that we have uh, observed here uh, we have seen that a believer should live a holy life no desire the the pure milk of the word put away malice deceit evil talking all those things from uh, uh, from away from us then we are also seeing that uh, uh, god's mercy has made us a chosen people you know just like the promised generation earlier uh, that was the jews and then we saw how one should be honoring uh, and submitting to the governing authorities and then we saw how one should be honoring and submitting the to the uh, masters okay or in today's word it could be your employer or boss or team leader or you know you want to use a different word for that so we we need to do that uh, why should we do that because we go by jesus is example jesus also was submitted to the father and because he was submitted to the father uh, he was uh, he was uh, uh, very meek when he went through the suffering that he went through here on the earth so in his attitude he did not grumble retaliate uh, you know accuse and uh, do all those things instead he went through it with the hope that okay if god is for me you know i am going to come out of this victorious so that's the way now coming to submission in the home context so now you would see um peter talking about how husbands and wives you know should uh, should really um maintain uh, that that uh, um, godly life okay uh, uh, and you would you would see like each gender what are the uh, kind of responsibilities if you want to call uh, that you know they should carry so uh, starting out here from chapter 3 and verse 1 it says wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands okay so same context now we must not forget you know he is continuing and uh, pointing out that there is an authority structure even in the home okay we saw the authority structure outside earlier and usually instructions blessings you know all that flows through that authority structure which god has established so coming to the home he says wives submit be submissive to your own husbands so the authority structure which is uh, established is husband 
is the head of the home is the head of uh, you know the the wife the head of the family the spiritual head and the wife is supposed to submit to her husband okay what is submit again again it's it's to be subject to or uh, to follow the leadership of or uh, you know uh, the actual translation also has the word obedience be obedient okay so uh, that is what it it means now how how can a wife uh, you know do this we'll we'll continue to see that but you notice here also it says be submissive to your own husbands so uh, now sometimes this a line here has been misinterpreted and uh, people say that women in general have to be submissive to men in general so which means that uh, if uh, there are you know men uh, in the church or men in the workplace men outside so by default women you are supposed to submit to any man but that's not what this uh sentence here says it's very clear it says wives likewise be submissive to who your own husbands so um uh, you know this cannot be used to uh say that all women come under all men it doesn't really say that okay so we'll see even later you know how peter will say that uh, you know husband wife you are heirs together so it's not so much about you know god making one better than the one gender better than the other that's not what it is it's more about the roles of the gender because we know as far as salvation is concerned as far as you know god creating man is concerned he created them uh, you know with with that uh, e sense of equality so that is quite uh, um uh, that's that's not what we are trying to contest here so it's more about roles so we understood wives are called to be obedient or uh, be subject to their husbands in the family context to their own husbands okay now to what extent it says that even if some do not obey the word so again going back to the the people of peter's time to whom he was writing this we have to understand that there were many women from the gentile background who were getting saved and uh, maybe once they got saved they probably had a question you know should we continue living with our husband should we leave the husband or okay now that i have become a believer do you think i am in some way more superior to my husband or you know should i preach uh, to my husband so there were all these questions that women had and in that context peter is writing to the wives and he's saying wives be submissive maybe no some of you have husbands who are unbelievers so he also says that even if some do not obey the word without a word may be won by your con by the conduct of their wives so this is not a license to say that you know one can go and marry an unbeliever because we have very clearly seen um uh, in in the bible that we are not supposed to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever but if two unbelievers get married and somewhere in the uh, journey one spouse gets saved that's when you know one is a believer one is an unbeliever that is the context so in that situation he is saying that if a wife lives her life or he refers to conduct what conduct godly conduct okay godly conduct of worship honor of god honor of her house her husband being submissive to the husband even if you know he is not a believer what happens the husband he says without a word can be won over so that's what he is saying if at all you find yourself in that marriage situation then you can live a godly life and a godly life is a great influence and you maybe you uh, preach at the husband or maybe you don't use any words he says without a word so just by the behavior uh, a wife can win over her husband uh, so 
yeah so that is the con con uh, context here uh, that a wife a godly wife can influence her husband in a positive way and then you know uh, he goes on to talk about um, adornment or the appearance okay, that a godly woman should carry so he says do not let your adornment be merely outward okay so uh, we would also recognize that he is not forbidding the women from adornment now for women you know adornment can he lists it out he says arranging of hair wearing gold putting on um, uh, fine apparel so you know, there are some of these things that um, are are pleasurable you know for women women like to do things like that so what he is pointing out here you have to look at it in the context so basically he is saying that conduct is more important than the external adornment okay so he is not saying forget about adornment that's not what he's saying but he's saying yeah even if there is adornment uh, what you must concentrate on is the conduct or then he goes on to explain the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit so gentle and a quiet spirit again in continuation to the submissive spirit that he is talking about so basically he is saying that a wife who is uh, 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 you know she's for the family she's for building up the home and uh, she is honoring god's authority structure of the husband over her mm, that is what god is looking for so uh, that is precious in god's sight okay so the emphasis is more on the conduct than about pleasing the uh, uh, husband you know just by external external adornment okay. so now yeah there are some play uh, people who who would say that yeah no adornment you can't put on any um uh, like it says here right hair what else it says hair and gold and fine apparel and things like that uh not necessarily because we will go to the next set of verses here where you see um uh verse 5 and 6 where there is a reference to sarah so sarah uh, again if you go back to the context of abraham's times abraham sarah rebecca they in this passage sarah is called as a holy woman holy woman uh, that trusted in god but they were also women who used to wear jewelry and you know adorn themselves so how can they be called holy women if you know they are wearing jewelry or you know uh, dressing up and all so that's not the point you have to look at it in the context basically he's saying the way he told about being submissive to the governing authorities being submissive to the masters so he's just saying be submissive to the uh, authority structure of the home so women understand that the husband is the authority structure in the house okay so with this we'll take a break we will come back i'll continue from where i've stopped Okay. So, if you have any questions, it would be really nice. We can discuss, uh, we can talk, and clarify many aspects. So, see you, see you then at ten o'clock. Thank you.